and I'm going to turn off my camera for for this um, for this moment as well. Okay, so the um, <clears throat> as we uh, do this do this webinar, I'm going to ask that you keep any questions or comments uh, to the end. Uh, but feel free to use the chat function to um, put in any comments or questions that you have. Uh, today's agenda is shown on the screen. Um, so in the first uh, half an hour or so, I'll present a summary of the outcomes of the iHub projects that we've, have, we've had in relation to healthcare facilities. The technical reports of um, all of the things I'm going to be talk about, talking about today either are already available on the iHub website or will shortly be available. So um, we won't be discussing the, the technical detail of the different sets of the work this morning. The purpose of this session is to provide you with the highlights of the outcomes for each of the sub projects. Um, which will then lead on to the um, later on in this workshop where we'll have a discussion where I'll pose some possible future directions for our collective consideration um, and lead to an open discussion of what, in your view, needs to be done next and how we might collectively enable those actions to happen uh, with a view to net zero carbon healthcare facilities. And I just find where my down button is. So the Innovation Hub for Affordable Heating and Cooling has had three activity streams the Living Laboratories, Integrated Design Studios and the Data Clearinghouse. The healthcare activities of the iHub have predominantly happened through the Living Lab stream, although there were three integrated design studios that involved aspects of aged care and a data clearinghouse project that involved a public health district. So this presentation will focus on the Living Lab outcomes but include a short summary of the design studios and data clearinghouse towards the end. So the Living Lab activity stream was managed jointly by myself at QUT and my colleague uh, Georgios Kokogianakis from University of Wollongong in New South Wales. So the QUT team was predominantly involved in the healthcare sector with one Living Lab managed by the University of Wollongong team and the Uni of Wollongong team were predominantly involved and managed the schools sector activity. So there were living labs involved in ACT and New South Wales schools. So QUT and Uni of Wollongong would like to acknowledge the significant support um, that we have had from the listed entities, in particular, the financial support for the whole of the iHub projects from ARENA, so Australia's Renewable Energy Agency, um, and for the AHIA, the Australasian Health Infrastructure Alliance and all the state health departments. And the outcomes wouldn't have been possible without the significant in-kind support of the Living Lab hosts. So that's Queensland uh, Children's Health Queensland, Bolton Clark and Warrigal Aged Care. Uh, Stantec Australia um, as a consultancy involved in some of the projects we'll talk about today. Uh, members of the Knowledge Sharing Task Group, which included the Marta Group, Uniting Care, Carinity, Baptist Care, Webster's Group and Neighbours, and, um, and the broader healthcare organisations, in particular uh, Doctors for the Environment Australia and Climate and Health Alliance. The overall purpose of the healthcare sector activities under the iHub umbrella related to energy understanding how, when and why healthcare facilities use energy, then determining how uh, demand can be reduced and managed, and particularly for HVAC systems, and how the value of renewable energy can be enhanced. The longer term goal is, of course, net zero carbon emissions and enhanced resilience. So over the course of the last two and a half years, uh, we had three uh, operational living laboratories. So two in aged care centres, so a residential aged care centre uh, just north of Brisbane and a uh, 
and independent living units, supported living units in at Warrigal Aged Care in Shoalhaven uh, near Wollongong in New South Wales and Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane. And in those three laboratories over the, rain, over the last two and a half years, we've evaluated a number of technologies that have been provided by third parties. Um, and they're listed on this table. So some of the evaluations were of physical technology. So in particular, the cellular blinds on the second row and the graphene coating on the fourth row were um, being applied to um, one of the living laboratories. So the cellular blinds were applied to the aged care centre and the graphene was applied to some hospital refrigeration uh, condensers at the children's hospital. Other technologies that were tested were digital technologies that were applied to HVAC plant operations. For example, that's Synengco, um, Exogenics and Buildings Alive. Yet others, uh, and this is the last two on the list, uh, so flow power and DNA energy were products that were theoretically evaluated based on the site data at Warrigal Aged Care in, um, in Shoalhaven, but they weren't actually deployed, but um, analyse that if the facility had deployed these technologies, what would the results be? So on the iHub website, there are technical reports about each of these technologies and how, how they were applied, um, how they were tested and evaluated and what the results are, were for those particular um, facilities. To understand how hospital energy use might change in the future, the AHIA supported a project which saw the creation of two hospital models. So these two models are based on real hospitals. Uh, so thank you to the State Department that provided um, the basis for these hospital plans. And they represent on the left a single, a small single storey health facility of about 8,000 square metres and a large multi-storey, six-storey major hospital of about 142 square metres. So these two models were built in Design Builder. Uh, that's a, a modelling software similar to IESVE, for example. And they were simulated in 10 locations around Australia, the eight capital cities and Mount Isa and Mildura as some inland um, population centres. They were simulated using the current typical meteorological year climate file and future climate files uh, prepared by CSIRO representing business as usual scenario for 2030, 2050, 2070 and 2090. The energy data was analysed in three ways as shown on the table. The heating loads only, the HVAC loads excluding heating and the site loads, which is the full HVAC, heating and cooling and lighting and the plug loads. So these particular models um, that were developed at QUT based on real hospital plans, but slightly modified for modelling purposes, are available to AHIA members for utilisation. For example, the models could be amended to match the National Construction Code 2019 minimum requirements for your particular climate zone, and then enhance to see the impact of a higher performing building envelope. So these plans are, were currently built um, based on 2019 compliance for the locations where these real hospitals are. You could modify them and see, for example, is it worth spending an extra X million dollars on the building envelope, knowing that you're going to save Y million dollars in HVAC operational costs into the future. So what have these models shown? So this slide uses 2022 as the baseline on the left, the current, and shows the reduction in future heating demand in all locations for the large hospital. So, for example, it's showing that in Hobart, it, by 2019, 2090, the heating load 
required by that large hospital will be about 61% of what the current heating load is. So all zones, all locations see a, a, um, a reduction in heating demand. In contrast, this slide, again using the current year as a baseline, shows the increase in the HVAC load. So this is the HVAC load without heating. So it's predominantly just the, the cooling load and, and your pumps and fans, etc. Showing the increase in cooling uh, in, in the HVAC load, in particular, the uh, areas that will have the most rise are those essentially from about Sydney North will have the most rise, or the greatest, the greatest rise. And it, for me, it was also interesting to see the rate at which the rise in cooling demand uh, grows. It's faster in some locations than in other locations. So an example of that is for Melbourne, where for the next uh, 30 years or so, up until about 2050, the HVAC load doesn't change much, but from 2050 to 2090, it does actually increase quite a bit. Whereas for Darwin, the increase is already uh, starting to happen at, um, at quite a rate. Similarly, for the small hospital, the heating demand is likely to fall significantly over time. And for the small hospital, it decreases about the same as it does for the large hospital. On the other hand, the cooling load increases significantly and much more than what it does for the large hospital. Uh, this is because we believe of the, the larger volume to surface area ratio of a single storey building compared to a multi-storey building and therefore highlights the need for single storey healthcare buildings in particular to focus strongly on the building envelope uh, now and into the future in order to reduce heat gain to um, try to minimise the additional cooling that will re be required. It's uh, worth noting for these two models, by the way, that the modelling was done assuming that both hospitals were fully electric and we were using electric boilers um, for, the, for the space heating needs, uh, so no gas. The, the use of electric boilers was just for illustrative purposes, not to say that that's the best option. So the full report on this study shows that for a, for a few locations, the comparative impact of using ground source heat pump systems um, instead of electric resistive element boilers, as they are a much more efficient option. So the full report sort of shows that um, the effect of electrification overall, but the double effect if you actually choose the most efficient um, electrification option available to you, which arguably at this point in time would be a heat pump. The AHIA could use these models, um, so each of the members, to investigate, for example, the electrification of your boiler, so to get off gas, uh, comparing different technology options. So that's another uh, use for the models that uh, could be put to play. Now, if a facility such as your own hospital or aged care centre has a net zero carbon goal or a 100% renewable energy target, the additional renewable energy would be required in the future to meet the increased energy consumption caused by the, the warming climate, which increases your cooling loads. So this table shows the increased PV capacity that would be required by the small healthcare facility in various locations over time in order to meet the expected increase in consumption. So the examples just shown were based on the building simulation studies where a model of a building is created in a building simulation software and a model of its HVAC system is included and then the software simulates the energy performance with different climate files. 
But an alternative method of modeling future impact is to develop a data-driven model. And this was done for the Queensland Children's Hospital. So multiple years of site electricity use data and weather data were used to correlate the mean daily electricity use with the mean monthly maximum temperature. So this data shows for this site that a one degree increase in mean monthly maximum temperature leads to a two megawatt hours a day electricity use increase for this hospital. And that's roughly 110 Southeast Queensland households daily electricity use if we assume 18 kilowatt hours a day. So then that correlation was then applied to the future weather files out to 2090, resulting in this forecast of uh, Queensland Children's Hospital electricity use out to 2090. So the forecast is that by 2090, under the business as usual scenario, um, of the IPCC would be roughly 113% of what uh, of the current use. Note that this forecast is based only on this hospital's electricity use data and doesn't include gas usage. Uh, this site currently has gas boilers for space heating. So this is just the electricity use forecast, assuming that the gas boilers stay. Um, the impact of, of heating electrification is yet to be better assessed, uh, particularly considering gas prices, energy security issues, and um, more forecasts for gas shortages um, that AEMO and the uh, energy market have forecast. So another set of modelling that was supported by AHIA's involvement involved investigating the energy impact of COVID-19 ventilation strategies. In particular, the early pandemic advice, and this was advice from the Victorian uh, Health Department back in uh, 2020, to increase outdoor air to 100% and increase filter efficiency to F9. So this was in line this with the general ventilation mantras that of dilution, followed by filtration and is common um, around the world at the time. So for this work, um, engineering consultancy Stantec Australia worked with us um, and we de they developed a building model, simulation model of a hospital ward as shown in the image on the right, based on the Footscray Hospital under construction in Melbourne. So this is a real a hospital ward. Three ventilation strategies were modelled so the base case as shown in the first row of the table. So based on the 2019 uh, National Construction Code profiles and using a single zone constant volume air handling unit, no zone reheat, uh, the pressures as listed. So this scenario uh, is, is not representative of the actual um, ward design for Footscray Hospital as the mechanical services haven't been fully finalised yet. But this is a fairly common uh, standard way that a ward would be um, ventilated. And then it was compared to two scenarios. So scenario 2A is that same design and ventilation system, but changed to 100% outdoor air with a pre-filter on the outside air and a F8 filter in the mixing plenum. And then scenario B is the same as scenario A, only the F8 filters have been changed to F9 filters. So what was the impact of that? So doing the um, energy simulations in the software then, uh, comes up with this graph. So this is the monthly normalised results. So it's kilowatt hours per square metre for this ward space for Melbourne. Um, so the blue line at the bottom shows the energy use of running the HVAC system for this ward over a period of 12 months. The orange is showing the impact of, so the energy use for running the ventilation system on this ward, if you change the uh, ventilation to 100% outdoor air, 
and then the grey line at the top is if you then change the filters. So there's not a lot of difference between the outside air and changing the filters, but there is a, a difference between the baseline and the 100% uh, outdoor air. Because of Melbourne's climate, as expected, scenarios 2A and 2B, so with the outside air, have a higher impact on winter demand overall when you look at the 12 months data. Despite this, however, the impact on summer peak demand is also significant. So on a hot summer's day, running this ward at 100% outdoor air um, will, util will increase the peak demand in kilowatts, the electrical load, by about 180%. This is particularly important if a site is paying demand charges. For comparative purposes, the same scenarios were applied to this hospital ward as if it were in Darwin, with the results shown in this graph. The overall impact on annual kilowatt hours per square metre is very substantial. 10 kilowatt hours per square metre extra in the coolest months and around 260% in the wet seasons. But why does this matter? If the purpose of ventilation strategies is to stop the spread of airborne viruses, surely if it's known that 100% outdoor air uh, is the most effective strategy, then isn't it worth it? Well, we wanted to test whether do we know that that the increasing the um, trying to dilute the virus, to dilute the air with 100% outdoor air, is it effective? So to examine this, Stantec used the same ward configuration and comp computational fluid dynamics modelling and known science about the size of various airborne particles to examine the effectiveness of different ventilation strategies in terms of the number of particles that remain suspended after a set period of time. And that's what um, CFD modeling does. So the scenarios examined are shown on this table. So the base case, um, as is typical of a general ward, um, assuming the doors are open and two large return air grills, um, then use it, the base case, then changing to 100% outdoor or changing to localised return. So where you have, instead of the two large grills, you have smaller grills in each room and the doors are closed uh, to the localised return plus some air, pu air purifiers around the, particularly the common spaces like the nurses station, um, or the localised return grills and air purifiers at the nurses station and individual purifiers per room. So there are the different scenarios that were analysed. And there is little scientific evidence about uh, the drop, about droplet circulation, recirculation, about how many droplets remain suspended and how far they travel and what their decay rate is in HVAC systems. So for this analysis, three droplet recirculation percentages were considered. So for the 100% outdoor outside air, it was assumed that there was no droplet recirculation. For the others, um, it was calculated, the calculations were done on assuming 25% recirculation or 75% recirculation. So this graph shows the net suspended aerosols after 600 seconds or 10 minutes. So the um, so showing the outside air is the dashed blue line. The best results come from when you have, um, a, if you assume a 25% droplet survival rate and you have individual air purifiers in each room. These are the percentage um, reductions as shown uh, compared to the base case are shown in the table below. So the best results are um, if you assume a 75% droplet recirculation, your best results are having localised air return and air purifiers around your nurse's station um, or the localised return and air purifiers in each individual room as well. 
Uh, so you can read the details of that in the full report. So what does this mean? The key findings at this stage seem to be, well, uh, a number of things. Firstly, that increasing the outside air percentage poses significant challenges to the operation of um, hospitals. So first of all, it triggers increasing cooling and heating loads and energy consumption. Secondly, that um, ductwork and coil capacities, depending on what the layout of the HVAC system is, might not be appropriately sized to enable 100% outdoor air without a significant upgrade. And the capital and operational costs of either the upgrade or the increased um, energy consumption seem to be at odds with the sustainability objectives. As well as that, the effectiveness of outside air is sensitive to the droplet recirculation rate, which depends both on the type and configuration of the ventilation system and on an unknown scientific quantity of how, how do droplets recirculate and what's their decay rate in a HVAC system. It does show, however, that portable air purifiers are highly effective um, in high respiratory activity zones and suggests that strategically locating local exhaust and filtration systems provide more benefit than increasing outside air. There is a lot yet that is not known about how to, um, how to provide effective ventilation. And we'll talk about that, uh, we'll discuss that at the end. The next investigation involved understanding the options healthcare facilities may have for participating in the electricity market through demand response, in particular through the use of backup generators, which are underutilised assets or could be considered underutilised assets. So this work was undertaken um, under our direction by another arm of Stantec Australia. So the three main pathways of participation are shown on this table. So on the left, the three main pathways in, in order of complexity are uh, no third party um, or AEMO registration required. You just work directly with your uh, distribution network service provider. You can participate through a retailer um, on the national electricity market, the wholesale market or you can participate by registering directly with the Australian uh, Energy Market Operator or through a third party aggregator who is registered with AEMO. Then under each of these, there are a range of um, mechanisms that enable participation. So through the DNSP, it's just through um, avoiding um, demand charges. So the price and type of demand varies depending on where you are. So it might be that you pay a month, you pay now a peak monthly demand or a peak annual demand in some parts of Northern Australia. So in Queensland, for example, in the Northern parts of Queensland, there's also a seasonal demand. So you pay more in summer months for your peak demand than what you do in winter months for your peak demand. If you uh, participate with your retailer, it's through the wholesale market um, and it, you might have an automatic control or opt-in out control. You might have a trigger price to say whenever the spot market gets above a certain price, then I want to participate. And you can have agreements with your retailer regarding how you split the revenue and how many hours of operation you want each year. Then participating on the electricity market, um, there are three main ways, so what's called the wholesale demand response mechanism, frequency control ancillary services, and reliability and emergency reserve trader. Um, the details of each of those are found in the report, so we won't go through those at the moment. So the electricity data of a major hospital was used to illustrate how that facility could, ben could have benefited or not from the participation in three demand response options over the past five years, um, using just one of its backup generators for this purpose. So we were comparing um, managing peak demand to reduce the network charges compared to participating in spot market high price events, compared to participating um, on the market through the frequency control ancillary services market. This graph shows that for this facility, 
participating in uh, the DNSP service charges um, was negligible, provided negligible uh, financial benefits, but participating in the spot market and the FCAS participation could have been financially beneficial, but different ones are different in different years and they can vary quite a bit. So for example, in 2017, 173,000 uh, could have been earned if it was playing on the spot market compared to last year, 262,000. Financial benefits from participation, however, tends to be dependent on extreme events on the NEM, on the national electricity market, which may or may not happen in a particular year. Uh, for those in Australia, take note of what's happened in recent days and recent weeks. And at the moment, the, uh, the spot price market, the wholesale market has been suspended. Uh, so future revenue forecasts are not guaranteed. As part of that work, the key risks or considerations as identified by the study are shown on this table. Um, because at, at the beginning of looking at, of, um, of determining to do this work, I had heard from a number of different healthcare facilities, uh, some perceived and real risks that they thought um, might exist. So Stantec have looked at these risks that were that were identified and put against it some mitigation measures that could be managed. So for example, there is no guarantee of demand response revenue or um, your return on investment if you had to um, upgrade any of your infrastructure in order to participate. But that can be mitigated if you work, for example, with a third party, either your retailer or an aggregator to negotiate a fixed payment. So we're certainly speaking to a number of hospitals who receive a fixed monthly um, income for participation. And we also spoke to an, uh, at least one hospital who had actually a cost and payment sharing scheme with, the, with a third party. There's ways to manage the, the loss of control of generators, how much control you want to be able to, to give to a third party. Uh, ways to attend to unattended plant stop start, um, minimum runtime of your generators, etc. So more detail of these risks and mitigation measures are in the final report. The final analysis um, done by this work involved the impact of the mandatory implementation of the Australian New Zealand Standard 4187 um, sterilisation, and that's um, Whilst the standard came into force, I think in 2014, it has to be implemented by different facilities by the end of either last year or the end of this year. So this table presents a case study of a large refurbishment of a hospital central sterilisation service department. And it shows a significant, so this was the existing CSSD and the new CSSD that was being planned. So it shows a significant impact on electricity maximum demand and on the annual electricity consumption compared to the existing CSSD. But in the process of complying with the new standard, they have electrified their whole um, sterilisation department so they no longer have gas. So they've gone, so for me, it demonstrates that the move to compliance for health reasons uh, to follow this, this standard for sterilisation also provided an opportunity for decarbonisation uh, through electrification. So even though you can see that the maximum demand and annual electricity consumption are quite significantly bigger, what we don't see is the um, greenhouse gas impact and the cost impact of being able to get out of gas, at least for sterilisation. So aside from the living labs, uh, one of the other activity streams of the uh, iHub was integrated design studios. And three of the studios involved healthcare facilities, in particular aged care facilities. So integrated design studios were examining the process of designing buildings 
in particular, the early involvement of architects, engineers, construction managers, etc. So beyond the design and construct uh, type of contracts we have now to an integrated um, design uh, processes and how designs evolve under that collaborative approach right from the beginning. These projects also uh, looked at the outcomes of the process in terms of reduced demand, better HVAC systems, enhanced value of renewable energy, etc. So there were three studios that um, where the designs were focused on aged care facilities, uh, one of those in Wollongong, and two um, studios that were focused on mixed use buildings that had to incorporate an element of aged care. So it might have been um, residential aged care or it might have been independent or assisted living units, for example, or um, mixed generation housing. So each of these reports are available on the iHub uh, website or will be available soon. So in the aged care facility, so the land lease facility that's planned for Wollongong, for example, um, one of the key challenges they found is that standards such as the National Construction Code um, are considered a limiting, effect, a limiting factor in deciding what can or can't be achieved. And it's important to note that um, building codes are not there to represent best building, but to represent the best of the worst buildings that you're allowed to have, um, in essence. And for that, uh, that design studio um, came up with five key aspects that were considered uh, commercial viability for uh, achieving almost a net zero carbon buildings. So incorporating design for well-being because that's the purpose of the buildings to start with, then passive design solutions operational improvements for your HVAC systems, uh, renewable energy, and considering embodied carbon impact of all the decisions made at the design stage. For the subtropical and tropical mixed-use buildings, we found that there are challenges in mixed-use building typologies in that there's no business as usual um, energy baseline, energy use intensity baseline that you can demonstrate improvement over. There's no clear methodology for allocating or reporting key, po key uh, performance indicators for energy in such buildings. And these buildings, similar to hospitals, so these buildings are both a home and a workplace, so mixed use buildings that have a residential component. And similar to hospitals uh, where you have both um, patients who are typically stationary and you have a range of different workers, that there are different thermal comfort needs which presents challenges to the HVAC system. Um, but we also showed that uh, if you have a significant reduction in cooling demand because you have much better buildings, then there are change, it changes the options you have for what HVAC technologies you can utilise, then the operation and maintenance costs of those uh, HVAC systems and the percentage of load that can be met by PVs. Then lastly, the, um, the data clearinghouse set of activities um, was looking at, so CSIRO creating a cloud data platform that then can be used by different service providers to create apps to enable the use of data to provide to drive better buildings. So the data clearinghouse activity um, had a project involving a health district. So Queensland Metro North Health has a diverse set of buildings with large variability in age and systems contained within. Like many hospital buildings, they are in a constant state of flux and receive continual and ongoing upgrades. And while telemetry and uh, sensors have the ability to generate large data sets, most of them are inaccessible due to on-premise data silos coupled with inconsistent naming conventions, while electricity and gas invoices um, usually arrive as a PDF or a paper document. So modelling data becomes a per building activity, making scalable application development an impossibility. Without a standard metadata scheme, application development cannot happen across the entire sector, which is one of the uh, perceived goal that would help healthcare facilities. 
So in this trial, um, Metro North Health was trialled the CSIRO cloud-based platform. And in this, they um, explored 10 key performance indicators that had been proposed by our Living Lab healthcare baseline reports, providing technical commentary on how they could be implemented in a hospital uh, precinct or our health district. So this set of KPIs moves beyond the usual uh, energy use intensity that's reported under neighbours reporting and included um, additional environmental and societal uh, key performance indicators as well as energy network key performance indicators. So how does the hospital's energy use impact on the electricity network and vice versa, um, including um, your self-consumption rate of any uh, rooftop solar you may have, for example, your net facility load factor, um, etc. Additional potential indicators for um, such as health indicators and resilience indicators have been proposed in the roadmap. So one of the key outputs of this whole set of works is a renewable energy roadmap for the healthcare sector. So the contents of the roadmap draw on the Living Lab subprojects outlined previously, as well as on the integrated design and data clearinghouse subprojects. So this roadmap uh, is currently undergoing graphic design before release, uh, should be ready by the end of the month, and it's presented in a form of a practical guide to assist organisations to develop a bespoke renewable energy um, implementation plan for individual healthcare buildings and sets of assets. So this plan focuses on stationary energy use and supply. So it can be one part of a larger net zero emission strategy that would also need to tackle emissions from non-energy sources. So the healthcare facilities for the purpose of this roadmap are defined as hospitals and aged care facilities, but the strategies can also be adapted to other types of healthcare facilities such as general practice surgeries, allied health practices, day surgeries, pharmacies, independent living and assisted living units, etc. Because of this broad target audience and the different stages that each stakeholder has in their net zero emissions journey, not all parts of the roadmap may be applicable to all buildings or all clients. So the roadmap consists of two parts, establishing a framework through which the plan will be actioned and then examination of the energy options. So the framework is represented by the first five of these circles. So first of all, setting your the time frame for your um, objectives and the scope, what's in and what's out of scope, your risk assessment as an organisation, establishing your baselines, setting your targets. So we've broken the targets down into energy conservation or energy efficiency targets, carbon emission targets, renewable energy targets and demand response targets. Setting the key performance indicators that you will need to be able to measure your progress against those targets. So we have broad and detailed uh, key performance indicators suggested in a form of a checklist. What data will you need to, in order to be able to inform those key performance indicators? What metering will you need to get the data to report on those KPIs? And how will that data be analysed? Then capacity building as an organisation, so whether that's building your financial reporting capacity to make sure that you're looking at whole of life or total cost of ownership issues, what policy and change management things you may need to implement, um, changes to your operations, changes to uh, and improvements in uh, staff training, for example. So that's all in the setting up of the of the ability to meet the guideline to meet your targets, and then some specific energy system options are provided towards the end of the roadmap that look at options for building envelopes, options for building services for renewable energy and for demand management. So that's a, that's a lot. So we get to the end now. So that's a quick summary of what we've collectively done over the last 30 months. And I feel really tired after saying all that. So based on 
this work, the text box here and the table on this slide are our team's reflections on what might happen next. And for this, I'm going to now put my camera back on so I can so I can see you as well. So it, for me, one of the key outcomes of the IHUB sub projects has first of all been the development of a significant network of people and organisations in the healthcare sector um, representing public and private providers and clinical and asset practitioners. And it would be great to see this collaboration continue and perhaps be formalised and expanded. So the clinical side of healthcare facilities, including Doctors for the Environment Australia, the Australian Medical Association and various medical colleges have been calling for a national sustainable healthcare unit. Um, and then I, th I think that might be worth consideration as a group that it, this could be a means of formalising and extending the network. And it could potentially include clinical perspectives such as from the DEA, AMA, etc., hospital asset management perspectives such as the AHIA and private hospital um, asset teams, aged care providers, uh, the air conditioning industry such as ERA, the renewable energy industry, neighbours, perhaps the Energy Efficiency Council and academia. So my first question is, what do you think about formalising the options for formalising or continuing a collaboration? Um, I will actually also just stop recording here as well. Just give me a moment.